In 1932, gold prospectors searching within the San Pedro Mountains of Wyoming would make a groundbreaking discovery. A find which, for a brief period of time, exposed to the world the past existence of a group of people, a secret, unexplainable race, which has been successfully covered up for over a century. Cast into the realm of folklore, this group of people could be attributed to tales of gnomes or hobbits. The once native Crow people spoke of their ferocious nature for many hundreds of years. No taller than 36 inches in height, according to William R. Corliss in his 1978 book Ancient Man, a Handbook of Puzzling Artifacts, citing the Anthropological Institute, Journal 6, 100, 1876. An ancient little people graveyard of vast proportions was once found in Coffee County. It was estimated that there were as many as 100,000 separate individuals buried there. And in 1932, two gold prospectors would thankfully expose the existence of the little people of Priori Mountain to the world. Deep within a mine on the mountain, they discovered a secret lair, a tomb, somehow placed deep within the rock face. Within this tomb, they found the mummified remains of a tiny humanoid. Now known as Pedro, according to Dr. Henry Shapiro, an anthropologist from the American Museum of Natural History, along with the several x-rays he made, proving his authenticity, Pedro was 65 years old when he died, and he had unfortunately suffered a terrible fall, which had dislocated several of the vertebrae in his back. It seemed to Dr. Shapiro, a head wound that he had apparently suffered some short time after may have been the result of his relinquished life, in a curious act of mercy by his fellow tribe members. The Crow tribe attest to these tiny people once being gifted warriors, feared by all those in the surrounding areas. They told of the little people murdering all who ventured near them, even decimating a group of 200 strong warriors who mistakenly trespassed into their territories during the night. Pedro ended up in a pharmacy in Wyoming, and for seven years, he was a successful local attraction. One day, when an unusual businessman offered to buy him, after apparently paying a very large sum, the man disappeared with Pedro, and he has never been seen of again. The only existing mummy of the little people, it seems, was successfully confiscated during the late 1950s. To this day, it is not known where Pedro is, although for the person who locates his current residence, we have been made aware of a substantial cash prize for the person who can bring him back into the public arena, or at least enable further testing. If you know where Pedro is, please do get in touch. There is someone with a rather large present waiting for you. Hey guys, so although the idea of leprechauns and fairies is considered to be, well, a fairy tale, there does exist a handful of very compelling artifacts, unearthed over the years, which have suggested the existence of an elusive race of tiny people. And although they were presumably wingless, judging by the relics found, they would be so small they could indeed be considered to look just like modern representations of fairies. A worn-in tiny shoe, found by a remote sheep farmer on an ancient trail within the Bira Peninsula in Ireland. Black in color, the craftsmanship that had gone into creating the tiny piece of footwear for our giant hands would have been highly impressive. He was amazed to find that the shoe clearly shows signs of wear, particularly at the heel. In fact, although tiny, this shoe had indeed been well worn in by someone no bigger than a pencil. The farmer eventually gave the shoe to the local doctor and eventually it was passed to the Somerville family. The current whereabouts of the shoe is unknown although it is rumored that it is in Munster in Ireland. At one point, it was examined by scientists at Harvard University. They found it was indeed hand-stitched by tiny hands using tiny stitches and well-crafted tiny eyelets. It was also discovered to be made from mouse skin. The belief in fairies or tiny humans is known as fairy faith. It is still found throughout Europe and the UK. In some parts of the world, such as Iceland, fairy faith is still very strong. Artifacts left or given by these tiny people have been documented on several occasions. The fairy woman's cloth of Bursta Fijal is but one example of a gift from these tiny beings. According to the legend attached to the tiny, unique relic, 
the wife of the district police superintendent and public prosecutor at the farm of Bursta Fijal in Vopnuf Jordur in the east of Iceland, received this cloth as payment from a fairy woman whom she had midwifed. The cloth is now in the National Museum in Reykjavik. Thor Magnusson, who is the president's custodian of antiquities, says certainly it's a unique cloth. There are some other gifts too up and down the Atlantic coast of Europe, including the flag of Macleod, kept today at Dunvegan Castle. The most famous object is known as the Luck of Eden Hall, a cup that was won fairly from fairies by a member of the Musgrove family. Today the cup stands in the Victoria and Albert Museum. The cup, which is astoundingly beautiful, is surprisingly of eastern origins. Although many of the things mentioned could and have been put down to elaborate yet entertaining hoaxes, the fairy or leprechaun shoe found in the remotes of Ireland is one of those extremely rare artifacts that does indeed seem authentic. This may be why it is hidden away from certain individuals who would probably prefer it disappeared forever. Thanks for watching guys and until next time, take care. Elongated skulls, along with their origins, are undoubtedly one of the most heavily debated areas within modern archaeology. Many independently funded researchers who have explored and subsequently exposed vast arrays of unusual and as yet inexplicable features surrounding a particularly few examples of these intriguing and incredibly puzzling artifacts. For regardless of known head-binding practices, a well-studied and historically an extremely common practice, thus one which modern science has an extensive understanding of, including the effect this had on the shape of the skull, makes any skull which endured these traditions are easily to identify post-mortem. The most commonly found incorporated wooden boards pressed upon the head, creating large, flat areas along the frontal lobes. Pressing the brow area of the skull upward, this malformation creates a crease or bulge near the normal napping areas of the skull, as seen in these photos of remains currently claimed as a suspected alien found in Croatia. Yet due to this knowledge of malformation, we can easily identify that it is indeed of a homo sapien. This so-called crease is easily identifiable upon bone structure. However, as previously mentioned, there exists a particular few whose remains not only have an elongated cranium, but the individuals in which they belong not only possess said craniums undeniably formed via natural processes but are identical in appearance to millions of witness testimonies describing what we all now know as the greys. With huge eyes, long wide craniums, frames of a tiny stature and micro-thin pelvis, remains of tiny humanoids, possibly visitors to our planet, who may have crashed here, subsequently marooned upon our planet, is an account which has been told before. We have in the past explored the compelling story surrounding the Dropa Discs, an ancient upark that, according to a number of individuals who have examined and tested them, tell this exact tale. Long barrows, granges, earthworks, and henges found across the United Kingdom all have rumors surrounding long-headed skulls being covered up after having been found at the sites. Passionately protected from trespassers, a vast number of the largest barrows have never been opened. Twelve-ton stones blocking the entrances, clearly suggesting they are buildings of tremendous importance, but without enormous multi-million pound machinery, permits, and most importantly, permission from the landowners, conveniently, all these incredible undug sites are set on private lands. We will probably never find what's inside, but many rumors abound like those which circle Bella's nap, tales which tell of more elongated skulls exhumed from the surrounding Earth during a normal archaeological exploration. Yet regardless of this seemingly meticulous suppression in the UK, an incredible find has nonetheless been unearthed in Crimea. Many of the intriguing features of the remains are the same characteristics which gave rise to the elongated skulls of Peru's popularity. Yet this skull still possesses its tiny, complete skeleton. The eye sockets, which once housed the creature's eyes, were enormous, and although the entire frame of the creature is of a small size, the lack of a pronounced pelvis would have made them very slender, 
and would have emphasized the size of the cranium. It is a strong candidate for the only complete elongated skull remains in existence. We find the elongated skull highly compelling. Sometimes an artifact will be discovered which challenges our entire understandings of the world around us. We are confronted with things that, according to our worldview, shouldn't exist. And in 1991, researchers performing geomineralogical studies along several Russian rivers would make such a discovery. Known as the Ural Mountains, it is a notoriously strange, cold, and incredibly lonely slice of the Russian landscape. Accounts of snow yetis and terrifying creatures have plagued the mountain ranges for decades, even including a reported attack by such a creature within Dyatlov Pass. The Ural Mountains is clearly one of the weirdest and most isolated places on Earth, and it seems it has also been the resting place for a series of several thousand tiny coil-shaped artifacts, ancient nanotechnology of an unknown and quite possibly alien origin. The larger artifacts made from copper, while the smaller ones from tungsten. What is clearly the most astonishing thing regarding these tiny ancient relics is their size, some of the exhibits being only 2.4 macrons long, or around one ten thousandth of an inch. Seeing as though the average human hair is about 100 microns, it's safe to assume that these microscopic objects were not constructed by our primitive ancestors for to create such intriguing objects would have required a knowledge and an application of sophisticated nanotechnologies. Not only do they exhibit characteristics reminiscent of components used within our own modern nanotechnologies, the nanocoils also exhibit golden ratio proportions, a trait which could only be present if intelligently designed by mathematically wise beings. Some skeptics to their true history have predictably attempted to speculate that the apparently alien objects were simply fragments of debris from the nearby rocket test facility, but a report from the Moscow Institute of Technology concluded that their vast age was enough to dismiss this as a possibility. The conclusive figure acquired from this official dating put their initial creation to around 300,000 years ago. Studies performed by facilities in Helsinki, Moscow, and St. Petersburg also backed up the claims that the coil-shaped objects were manufactured in the very distant past, stating that they predate modern history by some orders of magnitude. Unfortunately, as with so many items we cover, since the nanospirals principal investigator Dr. Johannes Fieback died in 1999, the research has been halted. What's more, Predictably, the current whereabouts of all of these ancient nano-artifacts is unfortunately unknown. It's fair to say, however, that the Ural Mountains still possess some of these curious and very ancient objects, but judging by their size, they won't be very easy to find. The Lycurgus Cup is a 4th century cage cup. It was indeed a style popular at the time. However, the Lycurgus cup is unique in many ways. Made by a mysterious and as yet not entirely understood process, which resulted in a phenomenon known as dichroic glass, a form of glass which can change color depending on which angle light passes through its structure. The cup's glass appears red when lit from behind and green when lit from in front. An astonishing achievement within glassmaking one which it seems was never replicated. The Lycurgus Cup is the only ancient manufactured artifact in existence which displays this unusual characteristic, and upon scientific analysis being undertaken, it was realized that the dichroic feature of the glass achieved had been no accident. The effect was achieved by, somehow, adding nanoportions of gold and silver dispersed in colloidal form throughout the molten glass. The exact process undertaken remains unclear, yet the perfection achieved within the process is clear for all to see. However, predictably, academia has attempted to claim that the cup's miraculous characteristics be but a mere accident, a freak result of experimentation, ignoring all of the cup's clear artistic qualities 
and claiming that the makers must not have properly understood or controlled the process, adding that it was probably discovered by accident, by contamination of minutely ground gold and silver dust. Quote, the glassmakers may not even have known that gold was involved, as the quantities involved are so tiny. They may have come from a small proportion of gold and any silver added. Most Roman silver contained small proportions of gold, or from traces of gold or gold leaf left by accident in the workshop from other work." End quote. The cup itself is a very rare example of a complete Roman cage cup, regardless of its extraordinary characteristics. The glass, painstakingly cut and ground back to leave only a decorative cage at the original surface level, is an astounding example of artistic capabilities. Many parts of the cage have been completely undercut. Most cage cuts have a cage with a geometric abstract design. But here, there is a composition with figures, showing the mythical King Lycurgus who, depending on the version, tried to kill Ambrosia a follower of the god Dionysus, Bacchus to the Romans. She was transformed into a vine that twined around the enraged king and restrained him, eventually killing him. Dionysus and two followers are shown taunting the king. The cup is the only well-preserved figural example of a cage cup. Where did the Lycurgus cup come from? Who could have possibly made it? Who knew about this miraculous technique? for creating this magnificent glass more than 1,600 years ago. With academia clearly overwhelmed regarding a logical explanation, their staunch denial of any unusual interference surrounding its manufacture is something we always find highly compelling. An upart or out-of-place artifact comes in many shapes and sizes, some clearly being or containing an anomalous object which no matter how desperately some attempt to discredit, the evidence is clear for all to see. This category of upart, unsurprisingly, often falls victim to theft. However, the other category actually litters the display cases of museums all over the world. These artifacts are being more easily explained away, and as such, they are often attached to a less impressive historical tale than that which was actually experienced. Stonehenge is probably the most iconic ancient site within Western Europe, an ancient site that, for many years, was to blame for many heated arguments between different individuals, all convinced of its past purpose. Now largely accepted to be a celestial calendar and a meeting place for many ancient people who came together at solstices to hold elaborate and purportedly promiscuous festivals. However, the true age of Stonehenge, or indeed how the stones were once balanced atop of one another, or the precise knowledge of celestial activities displayed, is still unknown. Although to those who study the many other seemingly impossible ancient feats found all over Earth, Stonehenge is clearly a relic of a far more ancient civilization than any which artifactual evidence have been found for. In 1808, William Cunnington, one of Britain's earliest professional archaeologists, discovered what has become known as the crown jewels of Stonehenge. They were found within a large Bronze Age burial mound, today known as Bush Barrow. Within the barrow, Cunnington found ornate jewelry, including an intricately decorated dagger. Quote, the very finest gold work involved in the making and positioning of literally tens of thousands of tiny, individually made components, each around a millimeter long and around a fifth of a millimeter wide," said David Dawson, director of the Wiltshire Museum in Devizes, where the micro-gold working achievements are on permanent display. The amazing process involved in creating the handle of just one dagger included up to 140,000 tiny gold studs, each just a third of a millimeter wide. The first stage involved manufacturing extremely fine gold wire, just a little thicker than a human hair. The end of the wire flattened to create a stud head, then cut with a very sharp razor no more than a millimeter below the head. This delicate procedure was then repeated literally tens of thousands of times. An incredible ancient artifact, found near one of the most enigmatic ancient sites in the world, yet amazingly, 
academia continues to deny the existence of out-of-place artifacts, instead opting to explain the construction of such marvelous work by claiming it was somehow the work of children, due to their more acute sight, this regardless of the clearly controversial evidence at hand. Who created such astonishing microscopic jewelry? Were these amazing artifacts once the possession of the actual builders of Stonehenge? Incredible items that are clearly amazing ancient oparts. The islands of Orkney, a mysterious place with an equally mysterious ancient past. We have previously covered the astonishing mound that can be found upon mainland Orkney, known as Maze Howe. This astonishing earthwork of gigantic proportions, an ancient site made from enormous ancient megalithic blocks, which although mostly hidden under many hundreds of tons of earth, protecting the site and unquestionably aiding in its preservation into modern times, the entrance stones are exposed, visible for all the world to see. Although modern academia, along with the thousands of people who visit the site each year, seemingly overlook this astonishing fact of the structure, or are simply unaware of the mammoth undertaking, the transportation and original placement of these stones would have been. Not only is the movement of these stones, according to the age of the site and indeed current academic study, unexplainable, their perfect alignment with the winter solstice is yet another factor which not only makes the site a baffling location for modern man to explain, but we believe makes it a strong piece of evidence to suggest the existence of a past, highly knowledgeable, highly advanced civilization that once flourished here on our planet. And Mays Howe is not the only astonishing, baffling, and as yet unexplained ruin which can be found within Orkney. Dwarfy Stain is yet another of these mysterious ruins that due to the astonishing size of its megalithic stone structure has survived the eons. Yet unfortunately, regardless of its clear historical importance, due to its inexplicable nature is ignored by an academia who simply cannot explain its origins. It is a megalithic chambered stone that has predictably been attributed to having once been a tomb. This identification of a tomb is commonplace within academic circles, an occurrence that can be found describing countless unexplained sites all over the world. We postulate, however, the fact that many ancient ruins of more recent historical figures have indeed been found in many of these attributed ancient structures. This is merely a result of their astonishing nature and as such, the past controlling parties of the lands they are found within selected these miraculous sites as their places of burial, rather than them actually being those responsible for the building of the structures. Carved out of a single titanic block of Devonian Old Red Sandstone and located on a steep-sided glaciated valley, the carving of this stone, along with the mammoth size of its closing stone, we feel is clearly indicative of a lost civilization. Any explanation as to how our more modern ancestors could have used such a stone, weighing many tons in weight, to seal such a chamber remains elusive. It is unique to Northern Europe. R. Castleden, a popular academic author of historical study, refers to the dwarfy stain as representing, quote, the imported idea of the rock-cut tomb that was tried once and found to be unsatisfactory." End quote. He presumes this dissatisfaction of a more modern constructor be due to the hardness of the old red sandstone. We, however, disagree with this hypothesis for several, we feel, obvious reasons. Firstly, there is no direct evidence linking the site to any builders of Mediterranean rock-cut tombs. Secondly, the size of the megalithic block involved in the construction, and indeed the hardness of the stone that was selected to create the structure, is indicative of a lost civilization's workmanship. This is due to the fact that the closing stone would not have been a viable size for any of our well-studied ancient ancestors to have used, worked, or moved. 
Why would they choose to make a closing stone of such gigantic proportions? And thirdly, why would they have gone to such effort in carving the build from one a single stone of notorious toughness with the tools they had at their disposal? All the other, we feel, more recently created tombs found in the area are not only vastly different from dwarfy stain, but were created with blocks of a far smaller size, as such, would have been far easier to work with, and thus are far more logically explained as our primitive ancestors work. The name of the structure is derived from a local legend, stating a dwarf named Trollid once lived there, although other legends claim it to have once been the work of giants. We will let you come to your own conclusions as to which legend would fit most accurately. Undoubtedly, an astonishing ancient ruin, one that due to its incredible size, has survived the eons to the modern day, allowing inquisitive individuals to ponder over its origins and indeed original constructors. It is undoubtedly highly compelling.